All right, uh, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we are gonna just wait a few more minutes to let uh, folks uh, arrive um, by the three o'clock start time. Uh, and we'll get ready to get this presentation underway. Thanks for those who showed up early. We'll be back in just a second here. All right. Yeah, just a surge of uh, folks to sign on. Uh, we're going to get started in um, just a couple minutes. We're allowing there's a little more time for people to uh, sign on and uh, begin the presentation. All right, we're going to give folks uh, about 30 seconds more, and then we'll get the presentation underway. started uh, some other folks are in the process of joining but uh, I'm going to welcome everybody to another uh, uh, edition of Public Leadership Institute's online training sessions uh, today's uh, topic um, well I mean probably unfortunate uh, that it is as topical um, today um, as it has been um, in the past uh, in the wake of the um, Parkland uh, tragedy that happened uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, effective ways on how to debate um, ban on assault weapons and the broader context of uh, stricter uh, gun laws uh, in, in this country. And so I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us this afternoon. My name is Dave Woodward. I will be your host of for today's session um, as the National Network Director with Public Leadership Institute. I'm also a uh, local county official, former state uh, legislator, and uh, today will be uh, uh, the person helping field all your questions, comments, thoughts, reactions, um, particular as it relates to this topic and uh, this session uh, today. Uh, just a little bit of background, you know, we got a number of folks who are joining us for the very first time. Uh, the Public Leadership Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, policy and uh, leadership uh, center really focused on bringing public awareness around a, a, a key issue related to equity and justice. Um, and that definitely uh, relates to um, gun safety policy across uh, the country, um, as well as working with public leaders um, as a way to um, improve, I mean, collectively working in a way to improve the economic and social conditions for all people. So 
Um, you can learn a lot more about us by going to our website at www.publicleadershipinstitute.org. There you're going to find all sorts of publications and resources and um, other information to help support your organizing uh, and leadership work uh, in your respective states and local communities, everything ranging from our agenda, voicing our values, uh, the education guide, um, we have a special project on advancing abortion rights across the country, and a, uh, our, one of our newest publications we're carrying you in um, to uh, support an inside-outside strategy, but particularly a guide for uh, strengthening advocacy on all sorts of issues around the country. And so all these publications are um, can be downloaded from the website, encourage you to be able to do so, um, and use, I mean, and go to publicleadershipinstitute.org on a regular basis to I mean, help support your leadership um, goals. Before we get into the presentation today, um, this topic particularly, um, but as it relates to all topics, we really do want to make certain that we create the space to bring your voice um, in, I mean, in, 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 and make sure we address all your questions and concerns as, it, as we go through the course of the presentation. Um, we have a number of ways to do that. We realize that people join us from a variety of locations, so sometimes it's not always easy to speak or type questions in, and we, we try to create as many opportunities as possible to do that. Um, if you have audio uh, capabilities from the location dialed in or um, through audio on a uh, tablet or um, uh, smartphone or computer, you can click at the hand icon at any time in the course of this presentation, um, and it, it, we, we'll pl pause plenty of time to answer any questions that people may have. Um, if you queue, queue me up, uh, we'll unmute you and we'll be able to jump in the conversation. Um, like I said earlier, I realize that people join us from uh, uh, locations that might not be, audio might not be the best ability if you type questions question bar. Uh, we'll field those questions as they come. And um, lastly, I guess this would be kind of old school technology. You can email me directly at dvp.publicleadershipinstitute.org. It's really hard to get to all the questions during the course of the presentation, but if they are things that come up afterwards, um, uh, we will definitely get uh, those questions answered. Um, this, uh, this presentation is being recorded, and we will put it up on our YouTube YouTube channel and um, will be available for uh, review and uh, all of you will be able to have access to all the information that we're talking about today. Um, it takes a couple days, um, but um, it will be up on uh, you'll be able to access it through our website. So without any further ado, I want to introduce uh, um, someone who's joined it. I mean, if you've joined us before, no stranger to um, our work here at Public Leadership Institute. Uh, but um, brings a wealth of, um, of, of experience, particularly on the topic we're talking about today, and that's uh, Bernie Horn, who's our Senior Director for Policy and Communications um, here at Public Leadership Institute. Uh, hey, Bernie, how are you? I'm great. Great. Well, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Um, Bernie, I mean, aside from his work here at PLI and um, experience as a communication trainer, author, lawyer, um, I do want to recognize um, his expertise, particularly in this space. And um, from the late 80s to the mid 90s, Bernie was the director of uh, state legislation nationwide for Hango Handgun Control Inc. Um, now, and probably more widely known as the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence. Um, he and his team uh, led the effort to enact uh, about three dozen state and probably another uh, uh, three dozen local. Uh, gun control laws during this period. He also acted as one of the chief lobbyists for the Brady Bill. And most important um, to today's discussion, he was the chief drafter and lobbyist for the 1994 federal ban on semi-automatic assault weapons. And um, kind of like brings us where we are today and we see AR-15s being talked about uh, um, and, and unfortunately too often involved in these mass massacres, uh, school shootings of late. Um, it, it, I mean, it, his experience is I mean, greatly valued. And um, in more recent years, he's been a consultant for state efforts to address gun violence. And as as a lawyer, uh, Bernie uh, wrote the amicus brief filed uh, 
in, by Maryland advocates defending the state's 2013 assault weapon ban when the, the unfortunately conservatives prevented its renewal nationwide. Um, a demonstration how states can step up to protect people when unfortunately our federal government chooses not to. So. Without any further ado, I want to, uh, Bernie, thank you again for being with us and uh, let's get ready to take it away. Very good. So I'm gonna hand over control to you here. All right, can you see that? That we can see it loud and clear. Okay, that's loud and clear. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dave, very much. Um, so this is what we're going to do today. I'll start with a very quick reminder of the resources available from PLI, and then I'm going to divide this into three sections. The first is facts about gun ownership and the gun lobby to show you uh, who you're arguing who you're arguing with. Um, the second is going to be the basics about assault weapons and how to argue for uh, a ban on assault weapons. And then the third is, how to respond to the gun lobby's typical arguments on assault weapons. We'll, we will stop after each of these three pieces for any questions you have. So I'll start with uh, the PLI resources. They're all on our website, publicleadershipinstitute.org. Um, we have the Progressive Agenda, which features uh, about 200 model policies for states and localities. Um, each opening, when you open it uh, on the left side, it has um, a description essentially of, of an ideal progressive um, agenda on that issue. And on the right, it has suggestions for legislation for this year. And that's true of 12 different issue areas. We have our message guide, Voicing Our Values, which does have um, uh, some of what I'm talking about today. Uh, we have our advocacy guide, Preparing to Win, uh, and we have our playbook for abortion rights. Uh, all of this is on our website. You can download it, either read it as HTML text or download it as a, um, as a PDF, and you can have the book for free. Or if you want Preparing to Win or, or, for, or Voicing Our Values, they're also available on uh, Amazon, and you can buy the book. So first, um, let's understand our opponents a bit better. First, how many guns are there? Well, the fact is nobody actually knows. Um, there is a guess that there's between 275 and 315 million guns in the hands of civilians in the United States. But nobody knows because before 1968, there was absolutely no records kept or no records required to be kept. And since then, we know how many are manufactured and how many are imported or exported, but that doesn't really tell us um, how many there are because we don't know how many there were before. And, um, you know, it's certainly possible that um, some large number were illegally brought into the United States and we don't know what percentage of them become inoperable every year. So it's it's quite a wide range. Um, there are about 325 million Americans. So that's 250 million adults in about 118 million households. That's all from the US Census. So there are more guns than adults. There's about two and a half guns per household if everybody had one or more guns, but the fact of the matter is that since the 60s and 70s, when about half of American households had a gun, it's dropped precipitously. Uh, one poll found 31% in 20, 2014. Another poll found only 22% in 2016. It's impossible to know because there's no official, um, no official list of any kind, uh, but uh, let's, for you know accuracy, we're going to guess about 25% of households, which would be 29 million households, own 300 million guns, which would mean that among the households that own them, 
there's an average of 10 guns per household. But you probably realize that there aren't 10 guns per household in most of the households that, um, that own guns. And we'll get to that in just a second. In addition to gun ownership going down by about 50%, hunting has also gone down by more than 50%. Um, it's a different culture. And this is going to continue. There'll be fewer households. There'll be less hunting because of the urbanization of America. Now, let's talk about who owns guns and how many they own. So uh, in the Harvard Northwestern study, 78% of Americans did not have a gun. And 21% did. Uh of the 28, 21%, 19% owned half the guns and 3% owned the other half. Okay, so what that means is that 19% um, owned 150 million guns and 3% owned 150 million guns. Um, and that, you know, the 3% is... Um, 7.5 million adults. So what that study is showing is that among that 3%, the average is 20 guns per household. That's, that is probably true, but there's a little more. There is this poll that was done by Frank Luntz of uh, gun owners, which came up with these results. And what it means if you do the math is that if you look at the 10 or more guns, um, it means that those those people um, actually own more than 40 guns per household. And that's just an average. And if you know anything about any activity, there are enthusiasts, you know, league bowlers, um, you know, coin collectors, um, and that there's this group that would have a lot more than the average. So it's impossible to know. There's probably something like a half million people in the U.S. who have more than 100 guns, which I, I call an arsenal. Um, there was actually an uh, arsenal license um, suggested in legislation about 25 years ago. But you don't know whether your neighbor has 100 guns. You have no idea, and the government has no idea. So... Uh, bring it back to you know why do you why do you want to know this? Um, the NRA is is generally who you are arguing against one way or another. Um, the NRA has fewer than five million members, um, according to their own um, communications folks. Uh, there's no public record of who or how many members there are, and um, you know until. 1977, the NRA was essentially a sportsman group. And in, in 1977, there was a takeover of the board of directors. And since then, they have truly represented the far extreme of gun owners. 74% of NRA members favor requiring a criminal background check for all guns. The NRA opposes it. Um, they just, they don't, they don't represent their own members, much less gun owners. So, um, you know, when you're, um, when you're thinking about the NRA, an awful lot of times I read people saying that the NRA is really controlled by the um, gun manufacturers and retailers. Um, that's only partially right. Um, you should understand that the manufacturers don't have all that much power. They're, it's not that big a manufacturing base. Um, it's, there are about, and no one, no one exactly has this number, about 9,000 actual retail gun stores in a, you know, in a, in a, that, are, that you can go to. Um, and they essentially act as grassroots organizers f geographically, and that, that's a very powerful thing. Um, 
and th you know that's a major part of of the NRA. Um, the second major part is the arsenal owners that I was just talking to you about. We're talking about like a half a million people who have an arsenal of a hundred or more guns. This is that's a guess, but I think it's pretty accurate. So those are those people are as enthusiastic or more enthusiastic than the gun store owners. And then the final piece is the Republican Party uh, has adopted the NRA, or perhaps more accurate, the NRA took over the Republican Party. And so um, Republicans, the, the right wing noise machine uh, has been repeating the NRA talking points for quite a number of years. And so the NRA, the, the Republican base is pretty much the same as these people who own a hundred guns. So just, you know, who are you arguing with? And then my picture here is kind of unfair. I was trying to elicit a smile from you based on the stereotype. Um, you know, the truth is that you're arguing with someone who's either, you know, a gun enthusiast um, or a rock bottom Republican, um, which either way, they're working from the same talking points. Um, they create their own reality. They say stuff that's truly absurd. I mean, the, you just... As, ask somebody from another country, you know, well, this is what they say. They're not, they just say that's absurd. And what we tend to do is we tend to argue with them as if what they say makes sense. And we need to do more, and I'm going to get into this, we need to do more of pushing away their arguments as quickly as possible and getting back two hours. Now I'm going to stop for questions at this point. Um, but you know, what I'm imagining here is that you are, you're arguing with somebody either live or maybe even more likely, you know, online. And when you're doing that, you're not attempting to persuade this person. It cannot be done. They live in a different reality. They believe something completely different. Um, so what you are doing, and keep this in mind, what you are doing is you're talking to a third party who is listening in or reading the comments that you're writing, because that's the only person who's persuadable. The person you're arguing with is not persuadable. Okay, Dave? Yep. So if you have any questions, I, I mean, today, I mean, up to this point of um, the discussion about like, what are the, um, just kind of like how many guns there are, the state of state of um, affairs and the kind of the context in which in many ways, frankly, this conversation is starting to take place. Is there any clarifying questions, any reaction to, if you have any questions, type questions in the question bar um, or raise your hand if you have audio capabilities and we'll unmute you. And Bernie, I mean, again, one question here from Patrick is like, does um, does this I mean, the the pre predictions or projections of gun ownership or presence of guns, proliferation of guns? I guess it's all depending on your perspective. Does that vary uh, from rural to suburban to urban areas? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the people who own tremendous amounts of guns tend to be in more suburban or exurban and certainly rural uh, because it's very hard to use your gun in a city. You know, you'd have to find a range in a city, which is a hard thing to do. It's hard to find a range for rifles in a city, uh, maybe, maybe handguns. Um, so it's kind of a wasteful um hobby in a city um unless you're transporting them to 
these other <laughs> out, outlying areas to actually use them, right? Yes, uh, which is a very, very common thing. That is for traffickers to buy guns in a state that has few gun laws uh, of its own and uh, traffic it to uh, jurisdictions that have strict gun laws like New York City. Right. Yep. No, and I think, I mean, it also sets kind of the stage, right, about how, uh, I mean, gun safety policy, appropriately so, can vary from urban centers to suburban, exurban areas to rural areas, um, just by, by the nature of like where, I mean, the concentration of these these weapons are, um, and frankly, where a, where an aggregate they're um, located. Um, I guess I mean I'll pose it off. Why don't we move to the next section? If people have Great. any questions, I mean, I think this. I mean, it, it sets up the sets up the conversation, the discussion um, based on where we are. So, I mean, here we, we're as we're now going to transition. The next I mean, step is kind of like the basis of what kind of the framework of this conversation. So, the legislation is about semi-automatic assault weapons and high-capacity ammunition uh, magazines that are used in these weapons. Um, so, a semi-automatic assault weapon is uh, three things. It's semi-automatic, it uses a large capacity ammunition ma magazine, usually holding 20 or 30 or more uh, rounds, and it has one or more physical features of a military weapon. Um, just today, I was kind of debating this with someone uh, about who was saying this this particular you know problem is not quote assault rifles unquote and and I'll try to explain that but basically one of the arguing tactics of the NRA is to have people say assault rifle and then there is a definition of assault rifle from the 1930s which is a machine gun so they they're ignoring the contemporary definition and they're saying it's not a machine gun and therefore there's not a problem we're talking about semi-automatic assault weapons we're using a definition that was created in the 1980s by the gun manufacturers in order to sell their guns first um, they are semi-automatic, which means that you get one shot per pull of the trigger, but very cleverly, the shooting of one shot um, causes the mechanism to load the next shot. So you don't have to do anything with a lever or, you know, or, or a bolt. Um, you just shoot, 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 but it's automatically loading the next um, bullet, as opposed to a machine gun where you hold down the trigger and it 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 uh, it's a flow of bullets um and and so you don't want to say that you're banning semi-automatics or or imply that you're banning all semi-automatics because there's a whole lot of guns that are semi-automatic that are not semi-automatic assault weapons um and, you know, this is um, large capacity ammunition magazines. Just some pictures. Um, the, the legislation bans uh, magazines over 10 rounds. Um, these are, oh, I see a 20, I see a 30. They're mostly, they're mostly 30 round magazines, I think. And then there is the... Um, the features of an assault weapon. Now, now here is the one of the arguing points, which is that um, the the NRA folks will say that these are just the same as a hunting weapon, except they're painted black. And so you you know you're making stuff up here that they they just look scary, and 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 there's no other uh, difference. But the fact is. There are features on military weapons that are primarily designed for rapid fire. Take the pistol grip, for example. Um, when you're firing this very rapidly, you can have more control of the weapon by having the pistol grip and the shoulder stock uh, and 
the the bayonet the uh, I'm sorry the barrel shroud toward the front allows you to grip over the uh, barrel in front of the magazine so that um, you know you have more control. If that wasn't there, it would be too hot to grab. You can't grab the the barrel of a hunting weapon. Uh, but of course, a hunting weapon is designed for slow, accurate fire, not rapid fire. All these things were designed very cleverly to maximize its use as a military weapon. Um, you know, a hunter doesn't, or a target shooter, doesn't use a, a folding stock. It would, you know, it's it's a dumb idea. Um, uh, they, you know, they don't need a barrel shroud. They don't need 20 rounds. Um, and the thing where it says bayonet mount down there, that's a bayonet mount for military use. And the thing at the very front is the flash suppressor, which um, makes, um, lessens the flash. It doesn't eliminate it. At any rate, an assault weapon is not designed to look scary. The U.S. military doesn't use this gun in its in a different form, does not use it because it looks scary. They use it because it is scary. It has features that f allow fire at tremendous speed without losing control of the weapon. And those are the features that make an assault weapon. Uh, I'll just, uh, you know, the, the, the assault weapon that's most, most used in um, massacres right now is the semi-automatic version of the mil U.S. military's M16. Um, the only real difference uh, between the M16 and the AR-15, and these are from different manufacturers, is that the M16 has one additional capacity, and that is there's a switch. The switch either lets you go semi-automatic or fully automatic, a total machine gun, or it allows you to go semi-automatic or a three-round burst, which in, in civilian legality is the same as the machine gun. So that's there's a little little place on the safety which allows the military to use it that way. But the military doesn't often use it that way. The military uses this gun as a semi-automatic overwhelmingly. That's what soldiers do. And so it's essentially the exact same gun used by the military as used by the shooter in Parkland, the murderer in Sutherland Springs, you know, that the guy shooting from the hotel in Las Vegas and so forth, you know, one after the other. Um, there are also assault pistols among, so it's not just assault rifles, they're assault pistols. Um, from left to right, uh, bottom left, that's called the Scorpion. The middle one at the top is a Tech 9. The one on the right is an Uzi pistol. Um, these are semi automatic uh, versions of submachine guns. That's what they are. I mean, the Uzi is a submachine gun that's been adapted. The Tech 9 is a gun that was designed uh, for its looks, I think. Uh, it it was it became popular when it was featured on Miami Vice some years ago, uh, but these are assault pistols, so there's not talking about just rifles. Um, an assault weapon ban is not hard to write, and you should make this point, and that is uh, federal law already banned these assault weapons in 1994 for 10 years. So between 1994 and 2004, we had that law. And it still exists in California, Connecticut, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York, who enacted their own separate laws. So this is this is not difficult to do. The basic argument is, first, start with the problem. You really need to 
remind people, even though it seems obvious, remind people about the assault weapon massacres. Don't leave that out. That's the motivation. Second, you have to explicitly support a specific assault weapon policy like a federal or a state ban or whatever it is. It's essential that you are able to talk about affirmatively what you want and not make this a generality because the other side will do number three, which is divert the conversation with fantasies. And so you need to have your reality, number two, in order to bring the conversation back to reality from fantasy. So I'll give you you some text. The reality of assault weapon massacres. Now, you don't have to remember all these numbers and, you know, this is just, just a model. And that is, you want to talk about the massacres that have occurred, that people already know about, that they, you don't have to educate them about this. They saw it on the news. Remind them what the problem is. And then say, you know, they were all murdered with assault weapons and any one of us could be the next victim. You know, we cannot let it go on. We cannot um, go on doing nothing. That's essential. The second piece is to identify a policy. So something like this is, is a way to go. Um, and it tells you um, not only that this law existed, but that it worked. Uh, you may be thinking right now, uh, gee, I'd like a copy of these slides so I don't have to write so furiously. Uh, we will do that. We'll we'll turn this slide deck into a PDF and um, send it to you. So you don't have to write down all what I'm saying and all what's on these slides. Um, the third piece is, again, don't let the gun lobby divert you. And I suggest that it's a good tactic right up front to um, kind of preempt this argument by saying, the U.S. is the only country in the world where civilians so often commit massacres in schools and churches and entertainment venues and everywhere else. You know, other countries have mentally deranged people. Other people, other countries have teachers who are not um, who are not armed. You know, other countries don't even have the security in their schools that we have. But they don't have the massacres we have, and that's because the difference between the United States and everybody else in the world is that it's legal that we have these guns, that this guy, this, this kid in Florida could legally buy an AR-15 and unlimited ammunition and then commit mass murder, and which is what happened. Doing nothing is not an option. And I, I think you should push that. Okay, so that's the end of, you know, what's your initial argument? It's actually kind of simple. After this, I'll get into what's complicated, and that is when the NRA argues a certain thing, how do you respond? And you'll see that I'm constantly trying to get you to brush off their argument their fantasy argument, and always bring it back to reality of the uh, massacres. Hey, uh, Bernie, we got our, our first question that came through. If people have questions, if you uh, type question in the question bar or raise your hand, we'll I'm calling you in this uh, Q&A break here. Um, I got a question from David um, that, I mean, ask, I mean, we, you're talking about some of the stats. What are the comparative numbers between 1994 and, 2000, and 2004 and now? So can you, uh, um, in, in the comparison, I mean, I, I mean you, you, you shared a lot of information there. I mean, can you... Uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, I guess specifically the question is like, this will be, than... uh, this will be a slide to come, but in the 10 years that the federal ban on assault weapons was in effect, the percentage of assault weapons traced to crime fell by 66%. During the same period, 
gun massacres fell by one third during 1999 and 2004 compared to the previous 10 years. And since 2004, when the law uh, expired, um, massacres have more than tripled. So, you know, looking at it from two different directions, it worked. Right. Um, hey, Carolyn's raising her hand here. Hey, uh, Carolyn, are you there? Yes. Hi, how are you? I, I saw your hand raised. I don't know if you raised it accidentally or if you have a question. Well, I do, actually. I was Great. just wondering, you said 78% of Americans don't own guns, but there's a, a lower, I mean, some of them are Republicans, right? Do the people who don't own guns subscribe to this that you know, they're coming to take our guns away every time somebody talks gun control? An excellent question. So generally speaking, and this is one of the reasons why I would want you to have a specific policy. Generally speaking, if you, if you generalize, if you say gun control, for example, um, the right wing has conditioned base Republicans to react that that's a terrible thing and um, you know maybe confiscation or whatever their argument is, um, generalities will not get Republicans. However, if you're specific, you do get them. Um, there was a uh, the widely respected Quinnipiac poll um, on February 20th, so just a couple weeks ago, found that Americans support universal background checks for all gun purchases by 97 to two. <laughs> so that's like, it's like virtually everybody. Um, uh, they favor a mandatory waiting period for all gun purchases. A waiting period, which doesn't exist in most places, by 83 to 14. And they favor a nationwide ban on the sale of assault weapons by 67 to 29. So the trick here is to make people think that that's the question. The question is yes or no on the specific policy, not on, quote, gun control, unquote, or whether we should have stricter or stronger gun laws. All these generalities tend to work to the advantage of the right wing's um, propaganda. The specifics allow you to be on the side of the overwhelming majority of voters, even Republicans. And it just incidentally, Republicans used to be more for gun control than Democrats back when I was lobbying uh, because they were more suburban. And, you know, the issues just become uh, polarized through uh, partisanship. Interesting. Um, Bernie, I got another question here from uh, Jennifer's posing. Uh, did the last um, the last ban um, pro, uh, assault weapons um, prohibit only new purchases, new production, or removal of already existing owned assault weapons up to that point? Uh, the 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 former. Uh, so it did not the new purchase. Got it. right, right. People were grandfathered in. Got it. Uh, one of the strictest um, of the bills is California, and they let everybody gr grandfather in, but they had to disclose to the state if they had one. So that kind of froze everything. Got it. Uh, and just like before, if people have additional questions, uh, raise your hand. Um, or type questions in. Um, we're going to pause for some more Q&A at the end of the next segment. Um, but um, Bernie, I think we're, we're good now and we'll, we'll continue. Let's, let's move to the next section. And um, if people have additional questions on this, even on this part or even the first part, uh, feel free to put those questions in. Um, so this is, this is my most important uh, piece of advice. And that is to understand that pro-gun advocates almost never argue the merits of specific 
gun legislation almost never uh, and i've been doing it for many years um their tactic and they're taught this tactic is to sidetrack the discussion talking about the second amendment or the te some technical definition of guns um or you know their misperception of what the proposed law actually says or ideas bizarre ideas about how other countries' laws work, or uh, proposing, very commonly, an entirely different policy that they claim will solve the problem. So when you argue with them, you have to concentrate, concentrate on steering the conversation back to the specific proposal at hand. Um, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in with the first one here because uh, Donald Trump suggested this one. Now, our side has responded to Donald Trump's insane idea by taking it seriously. Now, there is certainly a role for uh, experts to talk about the realities in terms of numbers and examples and stuff like that. But there's not enough consideration among our advocates that we don't want to legitimize a crazy argument. Um, we don't want to make that a serious mainstream discussion because it's nuts. This one's nuts. And if, if you don't understand that, then you're just not in, you know, you're not persuadable in the least bit. So I would let somebody else talk about the details and say, that's absurd. You know, Joe or whoever you're talking to, do you know any school teachers? I mean, do you know any of them? Because that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to suggest. And the only thing you're trying to do is to avoid discussing the actual legislation. Federal law banned assault weapons and large capacity magazines for 10 years. It's long past time to reinstate the ban. And then, you know, bring it right back. You know, do you really think we should be selling weapons of war to teenagers? Which is what we're doing. I, I think that uh, well, one of the things that, um, that I talk about here is reinstating the ban. This is because it's an unusual situation where you're talking about a policy that was done and is proven. Um, if you talk about impose a ban on assault weapons, it sounds like something that is... You know, we're not sure what happens. We don't know how it works. We don't know if it does any good. Um, I think that you should continually say reimpose because that points out that for 10 years we did this. It worked. Um, and, and what was the harm? We saved lives. What was the harm? Um, the next one. The AR-15 is not an assault rifle, okay? This is playing a game. So, you know, I'd, I'd say there's absolutely no question the AR-15 is an assault rifle. It's banned by federal law. It's banned by state law uh, in seven states. It's, um, this is just a word game. It's rhetoric. Um, playing a game with um, the, the, the language assault rifle when you know perfectly well that teenagers are being gunned down in school and we can't play games, we have to decide whether to respond to the slaughter with law or do nothing. And doing nothing makes no sense. As you can see, all, all, of, these, all of these little narratives are just guidance. You know, you want to just go with your gut. Just make sure that you don't sound crazy. 
on an argument, you know, it violates the Second Amendment. This is easy, right? It's obviously false because the 1994 law, which was in effect for 10 years, was not overturned by the courts. And there's seven different states that have this law that have not been overturned by the courts, and they went to court. The, the, the pro-gun folks went to court against these things, and they lost. And I could explain why, but you don't, it's not a good argument to talk about Supreme Court president, uh, precedent. And then just bring it back. Try to get rid of the argument as quickly as you can and bring it back to what actually happened. You know, Florida and Las Vegas, Orlando, Newtown, you know, where the children were six and seven years old. Um, that's, that's what we should be doing is to bring the argument back. Okay. It won't substantially reduce crime. Now, this is uh, this is a very very common uh, NRA uh, tactic. You know, it's like, oh well, crime crime won't go down. Crime didn't go down. They're talking about God knows what crime. In this particular case, we're only talking about assault weapons, and the evidence is that it affected substantially, actually, assault weapon crime. But how many people does it have to save in order for us to enact it? You know, there is no um, law that completely fixes a problem if we all we have to do is to show that this is going to make it less likely that we're going to have another Parkland High School. Um, and then bring it back. You know, how many children have to die? We have to reinstate the ban that was in effect for 10 years or something like that to bring it back. Another argument is it wouldn't have stopped a particular crime. You know, it wouldn't have stopped Newtown because of something. It wouldn't have stopped um, the most recent in Florida or Nevada for some reason. OK, I would say, you know, we don't make any laws that way. There are no laws that we say, oh, well. It wouldn't have stopped that particular harm. The law against murder doesn't stop all murders. The law against uh, the law that lowered blood alcohol doesn't stop all drunk driving. Um, all we ask of laws is that it makes um, our lives better and safer. And that's what the assault weapons ban does. And I think people, you know, see that as common sense. The federal ban didn't work. This is obviously a common thing. That's just false. It's just false. What they, what the NRA does is there was a big study, and they cherry pick what they're taking from that study. Well, out of all crime in the United States, there was not a reduction. Um, because they're comparing apples and oranges. You know, we're not questioning whether it would affect all crime. We're only questioning whether it affects assault weapon crime. And there are two perfectly good studies, one having to do with tracing guns that are traced to crime, fell by 66%, and the other study um, that gun massacres uh, fell by one third, and then after the uh, federal law was no longer in effect, massacres more than tripled, as you probably have noticed in the news. So the ban obviously worked. Uh, countless lives were saved. And the real debate is, should we sell weapons of war to civilians when it's been proven? conclusively proven that we can do something about it. Another argument is it will cause gun registration or confiscation. This is the true uh, gun enthusiast argument. They're, they're afraid of somebody's going to take their gun. They claim that President Clinton was going to take their gun. President Obama was going to take their gun. And Hillary Clinton was going to take their gun. Um, First of all, 
there's a federal law that says the federal government can't have a gun registration list. So there's no list to confiscate from. Uh, nobody has the desire to confiscate people's guns. The real issue is, should we reinstate the federal assault weapons ban? Another argument is we should do something about mental health or video games, or I'm sure you've heard some of these in the last two weeks. You know, oh, well, the real problem is something else. I'd say if, if it was, a, you know, not an unreasonable thing, like we've got to put more resources into mental health, um, I'd say, you know, that's fine. But one policy is not an argument against a different policy. If you did strengthening mental health services and an assault weapon ban, they are not contrary. It's not an either or debate. It's not a legitimate argument against this law. So go ahead and talk about that some other time. But if we're talking about this law, that's irrelevant. Let's get back to the legislation on the table. Um, this is, you know, this is kind of a slogan of the NRA. Um, the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is with a good guy with a gun. I would, you know, I, I think that examples work best and there are dozens of examples, but these are a couple that are well known. Um, it doesn't work in real life. There was an armed deputy sheriff at the high school in Parkland, Florida. There was an armed deputy sheriff at the Columbine High School massacre. Uh, that was true in many other massacres. But remember back when President Reagan was shot, if you look at a picture, he was surrounded by police and Secret Service agents. He was surrounded by people who were experts with guns and they were had the guns on them and he was still shot and almost died i mean it was just it was just sheer luck that he didn't it just doesn't work we need to you know can we need to reinstate the ban it worked um why did the 1994 federal ban pass? It was for this same argument, that is talking about the massacres that were occurring. This one at the time was perhaps the most famous. On January 17, 1989, a man walked onto a schoolyard in, um, in, in California and um, started shooting with uh, an AK-47 that was a semi-automatic Chinese-made weapon with multiple high-capacity ammunition magazines. He killed these five little children, tiny little children, and wounded 30 others. And it was this that really started the effort and, um, and other examples that followed. And that's, that's the only way to make a difference now. You know, this is the reason when you're asked, you know, this is the reason. Um, December 14th, 2012, this 20 year old man killed 20 children and six adults at the Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, he used a Bushmaster version of the AR-15 and multiple high-capacity ammunition magazines. All of the children were six or seven years old. Doing nothing is not an option. And that's what we're doing. We're doing nothing. And that's, that's the most powerful way to make your argument. And that's, that's the end. So questions about any of what I've said. Uh, and as we've stated before, uh, if there are questions as it relates to any of the, any of the presentation, uh, type question in the question bar, raise your hand. Um, and uh, I mean, to talk about, uh, I mean, just I mean, to give 
any clarification, pushback, uh, kind of share your thoughts um, as we kind of, I mean, dig deeper into this conversation. Uh, and Bernie, I'll start off with, do you sense, and, and you, you have, um, I mean, such an incredible perspective on this. I mean, kind of what the conditions that led to the adoption of the Brady Law, um, and the ban on assault, uh, assault weapons, getting the, the letting expire the, uh, the, the, the bill and where we are today. Do you sense a, I guess, temperature change in the, for the demand for action? I mean, what is your kind of, 10,000 foot, 30,000 foot perspective. I mean, are the conditions comparable to, if not even more intense, given this, I mean, some of these horrible um, uh, tragedies that have happened um, in the, I mean, in the wake of the exp uh, the, the expiration of uh, the Brady Law, um, it brings us where we are today. Like, where, do, I mean, what are your general like, feelings on that? <laughs> well, I'd say yes and no. <laughs> um, I'm going to start. I'm going to start with a no. Um, okay. You know this. This U.S. Congress is not passing the bill. They're just not going to because the NRA is going to tell them not to, and they control the Republican Party on this issue. The um, and and you know that's true of uh, state legislatures as well. So uh, if there is a, a sea change in public opinion, it's there's no outlet or there's very few states where there's an outlet to change the law. Uh, however, these incidents have raised the issue high in people's agendas, right? They, they always, were concerned about assault weapons and and they always wanted background checks on all guns and so forth but you know they were thinking about education and the economy first and now it's it's much more visible and people are thinking about it more so that in the upcoming election it could be pretty devastating for uh pro-gun members of congress and state legislators uh because people will respond emotionally and logically by voting for their opponents. So there's, you know, there's a real outlet for people electorally, if not legislatively. Right. I mean, yep. Uh, uh, Jennifer, I mean, raised the question that some gun um, uh, people will tell, um, tell her that it, Semi-automatics semi are used for hunting. Address that. Yeah, we're taking sure, an AR-15 yeah. out there, and they're just slaughtering livestock. Or ah, well, this whatever. this this is one of the word games. We're 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 some we're talking about one of the word games. So someone will talk about semi-automatics and say semi-automatics are used in hunting, and yeah, that is a gun that um, where each time you pull the trigger a bullet is automatically chambered so that you don't have to lever it or, you know, do something else in order to put another bullet in. Yes, there are some very nice hunting guns um, like that. Um, they have a magazine of two or three bullets. You know, they don't have any of the features of a military weapon. You would look at the gun and you would know perfectly well that it's a hunting rifle. Um, and there's no question of it. So semi-automatic is not the language that we should use. Now, if somebody says that they use, uh, you know, an AR-15 for hunting, I'd say that person is one huge goofball. I mean, that, that is, that's just crazy. Um the real use of an AR-15 is to shoot at tin cans. Honestly, that's the whole point, is to shoot at tin cans. Uh, if you're going to go hunting, um, you're going to use a hunting rifle. And in many states, it's illegal, it violates the, the rules for hunters, to use a large capacity magazine anyway. So it's already in effect, banned for hunting. 
right. Uh, and I mean, she went on further to ask, uh, you talked about specific features of pistol grips, et cetera. Are, are those in proposed legislation about, I mean, is it trying to get these broader, like high magazine bump stop? I mean, it's all these, I, I, I feel that it's, it, we have, have the conversation so often that, that it gets lost into the, into the jargon. <laughs> a very good question. Very good question. Okay. So, um, Assault weapon legislation defines assault weapons three ways. One is through these features. So it has to be semi-automatic that accepts a large capacity ammunition magazine first, or it is one of the guns that is on a list. Some of the lists can be quite small of, you know, about 11 guns. Um, the the Diane Feinstein list in U.S. Congress right now is an extremely detailed um, list of what is an assault weapon, and then the third category is a copy or facsimile of an assault weapon. So that there's three different ways that you can show that a gun is an assault weapon, and um, Works pretty well in places like California. Got it. Uh, additional questions. So, Bernie, prediction: Are we going to I mean, see the call for increased gun safety be lifted up by progressive public leaders um, from this point like, leading up? to maybe this fall or will I guess I'm gonna call like uh, tr uh, other forces come back trying to suppress that conversation well you're asking for a real prediction here and it's, <laughs> it's impossible yeah. to do but let, let me just suggest that if there was no real high-profile mass shooting between now and the election that um, the media is going to forget about it however let me suggest there will be. Um, the last three all occurred with about within about six months of each other. Um, I think that it's more likely than not that there'll be another high-profile mass shooting with an assault weapon before the election. And um, that will raise it back up in the eyes of the media. And the, you know, the media decides what's the issue the media decides what people are thinking about, and another shooting would do that. Right, and that's the sad conditions. It's like, it, I mean, if that is that the thing that's required to, I mean, force the inaction. I mean, I, and I've said this before. We have uh, students that can't even vote. That has, in many ways, lifted and moved the needle on the 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 attention and demand to take action. Um, in what in some cases that grown-ups haven't been able to do um, since I mean the last major gains in gun safety um, were passed and um, I mean shame on all of us if that's what it means required to actually do what's what make is common sense and protects communities and protects kids and, and, and families and what have you um, but it's I mean I, the reason why I brought I mean bring it up in the, in the context of in the conversation is just like even in the, in the matter of the last couple of weeks and obviously that comes in the wake of this the, the horrible um, I mean Parkland um, issue people who have been reluctant to try to take on this topic um, it, it's, it's anecdotal to this date um, but the intensity and surge for um, I mean, I think that some of the recent point you cited like, just shows it's like it's it's overwhelming. Um, but even in, I mean, smaller groups, uh, the kind of the intensity of the conversation is, I mean, I, I definitely feel there's a difference. Um, and again, I don't know if it's because it's so close in the wake of the, the last event and time will pass and no one's talking about it. Will it continue? Um, I guess it's, I mean, we'll see. But there definitely seems like the opening is definitely there, and this is the. I mean, it seems like it's an appropriate moment for public leaders to, I mean, step forward, um, using some of the message frame that you talked about. You know, I mean, how I mean to advance this, and that collectively creates the catalyst for for change long term. 
So I, I mean, this moment I'm optimistic. I guess I mean time will tell on this. I'm kind of optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, this is like full circle for. I mean, I, and I think again, I think it's important for those who joined us during the course of this presentation. I mean, Bernie comes. I mean, uh, in the late '80s and mid '90s into the, uh, um, I mean, the chief lobbyist for the Brady Bill. I mean, it's like this is. I mean kind of where we are and, and I can only imagine like the day they chose not to take action and renewal of protecting um, uh, uh, renewing the the ban on seven automatic assault weapons um, like like what that's it's like all this work and like why and and the results I mean I mean demonstrated um, that it was good public policy it actually did work um, and uh, kind of see where we are. I mean, where we are today. So, I'll take your cautiously optimistic, somewhat optimistic. I mean, state and and I think for everyone who's joining us, um, I think there is. Uh, I mean, I think this information and taking this information and and reaching out to our public leaders and I think demanding action. I mean, what are I mean, what are we doing? Um, we it, doing nothing is is not an option. And I think it is a theme that can. Um, I mean, they can build momentum to the, to the degree that people demand further action. All right. Well, without any further ado, I guess we'll, we'll close this out. I want to thank everyone for joining. We're, um, like Bernie uh, mentioned, that we will synthesize this into a PDF, in we, which we can make sure is distributed to everyone who joined us today um, and, uh, and be on our website, as well as a recording of this presentation. So I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be with us on this very topical um, subject. Um, and Bernie, as always, thank you for I mean, always being there, bringing I mean, wisdom and context on how to talk about this, but particularly uh, on a subject to which you bring such great expertise into it. Um, it's so important, especially today. Thank you, Dave. Okay. All right. Until next time, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.